by Gandhi. A priest who had many different experiences, parish priest, study for a doctor's de degree, wrote a thesis on St. John Fisher, the martyr bishop of Rochester. I mean, not in Minnesota, I mean in England, the time of Henry VIII. He worked for many years for the Congregation of Religious at the Vatican. And that's where I first met him. Met him. And, uh, well known for his many articles on Our Lady. You'll find some in the Missio Immaculate magazine. It's free for the taking in the day here. And he's also a well-known, popular speaker, especially on Our Lady. And he's going to speak to us about certain features of total consecration to Our Lady as they are set forth in the teachings of Our Lady at Fatima, particularly centering on the sacrificial aspect. Why is total devotion, entrustment, dedication to Our Lady called a consecration? Remember a moment that if we fully live our faith, we'll be standing at the foot of the cross with Our Lady. We will be a part of the sacrifice. There cannot be any truly, fully efficacious faith unless we are willing to identify through Our Lady with the sacrifice of Jesus. And with that short introduction to one of the key points in the conference, I'll give you my senior mandate. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct, O Lord, our actions by thy holy inspiration, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every word and work of ours may always begin in thee, and by thee be happily ended, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, St. Joseph, St. Maximilian Mary Colby, all you holy angels and saints, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Peter, Damian, Mary Feldner. A special thanks also to Father Jacinto, Brother Joseph, Brother Rodrigo, and Brother uh, Didicus, and all the Franciscan friars for their kindness in putting on this symposium. What a pleasure it is for me to be here, to be able to speak with Dr. Dodd and Father Gately, to be able to examine some very important points for our spiritual lives. And what a special gift it is to have so many gather here today on the vigil of that day on which Pope Francis will consecrate the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Before I left Sioux Falls yesterday, I did have to take a quick look at the Vatican website to see if anything was posted. And yes, there is a beautiful picture of Pope Francis and our Blessed Lady of Fatima and then if you click on, you can see the schedule of events for today. I imagine right about now, uh, the Holy Father is having the vigil in St. Peter's Square. And tomorrow he'll have Holy Mass. And I noted that the act of affidamento, as the Italians say, the act of entrustment, consecration, will occur tomorrow during the Holy Mass, right after the post-communion prayer before the Angelus and final blessing. So something to look forward to, to hear and to be able to read this act of consecration that the Holy Father will offer to us tomorrow. So much interest in the fact that Pope Francis has shown in six short months his great love and devotion to Our Lady. And he, of course, has been a catalyst for our own reconsideration of Mary in our lives. So for that, we're very grateful. Also, special greetings today to all who will be listening on Air Maria. Could there be a clearer connect connection between the year of faith, our Blessed Lady, and the new evangelization? It is Our Lady who inspired Pope Benedict to provide this year of faith, 
which has as its natural outcome a fresh and vigorous new evangelization. In our Diocese of Sioux Falls, we just had our annual clergy days, which is an opportunity for the priest to gather with our local bishop, Paul Swain, who's not uh, originally not far uh, from here, uh, from the Diocese of Madison. And we had this year a very special emphasis on the importance of the new evangelization. So all the priests and deacons came together to hear again about this important dimension in the life of the church. And I'll be saying something, as Father Peter said, specifically about evangelization. So we could say that Mary has led us to the year of faith, which in turn will lead to a resurgence in evangelization. Well, specifically, my presentation today is entitled, The Summons to Sacrifice for Sinners, as given by Our Lady of Fatima and exemplified in the life of St. Mary, uh, Maximilian Mary Kolbe. Perhaps the element of Our Lady's request at Fatima that is most known is her insistence on prayer. Prayer is very vital in the message of Fatima, and we see Our Lady did not lose any time in insisting to the three children the importance of praying, especially the Holy Rosary. Also, a kind of outcome of prayer is our newness of life, the new beginning that we have, the way we live our lives. And to that extent, our Blessed Mother also insisted on the wearing of the brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Perhaps what is less recalled from the message of Fatima is Our Lady's summons to sacrifice for sinners, which is closely aligned to her call to make reparation for our sins and those of others. Here we're really talking about, in a phrase, the daily duty. To do our daily duty, that is, to be involved with prayer, in our vocation, in the works which come from our vocation, all under the banner of trust in God, as well as reparation for sins and sacrifice for sinners. Father Robert J. Uh, Joseph Fox, who was the founder and director of the Fatima Family Apostolate, when asked about whether the Warner Brothers picture from the 1950s about Our Lady of Fatima was a good presentation of the Fatima message, responded by saying, yes, it's a good introduction, However, it doesn't say much about sacrifice. Now perhaps that's not to be uh, in any way scorned. We certainly can understand something from that film, and I think that film still continues to touch hearts. But we have to remember that the element of sacrifice is also very crucial in the message of Our Lady of Fatima. In our presentation this morning then, we'd like to look at Our Lady's call to sacrifice for sinners and how that call was lived out by her faithful son, St. Maximilian Mary Kolbe. Most spiritual writers and scholars would say that any discussion of the Fatima message and Our Blessed Lady's six apparitions in 1917 should also include a clear reference to the angels presence at Fatima in 1916. Remember that the appearance of the angel 1960, 1916 preceded our Blessed Lady's appearance in 1917. It was in the summer of 1916 during the second appearance of the angel that we have reference to sacrifice. The guardian angel of Port Portugal said to Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta, Pray, pray very much. The hearts of Jesus and Mary have designs of mercy on you. Offer prayers and sacrifices constantly to the Most High. Now, in that second appar apparition of 1916, the summer of that year, the angel was not finished giving counsel. He continued, Make of everything you can a sacrifice and offer it to God as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended, and in supplication for the conversion of sinners. 
You will thus draw down peace upon your country. I am its angel guardian, the angel of Portugal. Above all, accept and bear with submission the suffering which the Lord will send you. So very clearly, the guardian angel of Portugal is telling the children about the importance of sacrifice. Now remember, these little ones were not able to read. They were tender little youths. And yet it was the angel from on high who made this message very clear. Even those little hearts could understand the importance of sacrifice for sinners. Not only the sins of others, but also our sins as well. When we turn to Our Lady's apparitions of 1917, there are several in which Our Blessed Mother makes very distinct reference to sacrifice. On Sunday, May 13th, the first apparition, Our Blessed Lady comes to the children and first informs them that she will do them no harm. She proclaims that she is from heaven, from paradise, and wants Lucia and her two cousins to return to the Cova da Iria every 13th of the month for the next six months at the same hour. Later, in time, Our Lady will reveal her identity and what she desires. Our Lady will even return for a seventh time, and that makes reference to the fact that after the 1917 apparitions, as many of you know, Our Blessed Lady did appear again to comfort the children and to give them strength. Especially, the reference here is to the apparition to Sister Lucia on June 16, 1921. Well, Our Blessed Lady assured Lucia and the three seer seers that they would go to heaven, but first Francisco would have to pray many rosaries. When Lucia asked whether her two deceased friends, Maria and Amelia, were in heaven, Mary answered, yes, regarding Maria. As to Amelia, she will be in purgatory until the end of the world. And then Our Lady said, are you willing to offer yourselves to God and bear all the sufferings he wills to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and of supplication for the conversion of sinners? The children responded, yes, we are willing. Then Mary continued, you're going to have to suffer much, but the grace of God will be your comfort. And then enveloped by an intense light that emanated from Mary's open hands, the children felt compelled to kneel and prayed. O most holy trinity, I adore you. My God, my God, I love you in the most blessed sacrament. So in this first apparition of May 1917, our Blessed Lady speaks again very clearly to the children of sacrifice. Let's move on now to the third apparition, July of that year, Friday, July 13th. Now when we think of the July apparition of our Blessed Mother in Fatima, we often think of this incredible revelation of hell, and that's rightly that we do so. But we also remember that before that revelation, Mary had something to say once again to this trio of children about sacrifice. Our Lady report repeated the importance that the children return on the 13th of the month and daily recite the Holy Rosary. This time in July, Mary added that the Rosary should be prayed in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary because only she can help you. Now, Our Lady was very sympathetic to the suffering that Lucia was undergoing. As you remember, Lucia was not believed by many. Even her family, some of her family members, did not believe that she really saw Our Lady. So Our Lady was sympathetic to Lucia and her suffering, and she said that in October, she, Our Lady, would give her identity and perform a great miracle. Lucia asked for help for others, for those who were suffering, and our Blessed Mother said that it was necessary for those persons to pray the Holy Rosary to obtain those graces. 
And then our Blessed Mother exhorted the children to sacrifice themselves for sins in order to communicate their love for Jesus, to convert sinners, and to repair for the offenses against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. At that time, she then showed them the horrifying vision of hell. This is the first secret of Fatima, and this shook the children profoundly. She gently addressed the children, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. She also disclosed the second secret of Fatima. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a knight illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are not heeded, Russia will be converted. If my, sorry, if my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. Our Lady continued, the good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me and she will be converted and a period of peace will be granted to the world. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. You know that the third secret, which was revealed later in the year 2000, is related to the wicked persecutions against the church and her children that have occurred during recent years. Well, we've already seen now our Blessed Lady's summons to the children during the May and July apparitions. Let's move on to August 1917. The fourth apparition of our Blessed Mother. Sunday, August 19th is when our children saw Our Lady because as you know, it was the administrator of the town of Villanova de Orem who prevented the children from being at the cova. He imposed various threats on them and frightened them if they did not reveal the secret. But these various, various machinations did not stop Our Lady from making August 19th the date of her arrival. Mary stated again that her, her desire that the children pray the Holy Rosary every day and that a miracle would be a due in October. However, the miracle's greatness would be lessened because of the efforts of the civil authorities in detaining the children. Our Blessed Lady had something to say here about sacrifice. Pray, pray very much and make sacrifice for sinners. For many souls go to hell because there are none to sacrifice themselves and to pray for them. So for the third time, a very clear and precise call to sacrifice. In the fifth apparition of September, September 13, 1917, despite the difficulty in reaching the Kova due to the approximately 30,000 persons in attendance, the children eventually arrived at the sacred spot. And after the usual exchange between Mary and Lucia, Our Lady said, in October, our Lord will come, as well as Our Lady of Dolors, that is Our Lady of, Sac of Sorrows, and Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Saint Joseph will appear with the child Jesus to bless the world. Then Mary said, God is pleased with your sacrifices. He does not want you to sleep with the rope on tied around the waist, but only to wear it during the daytime. You may remember that earlier the children took upon themselves various sacrifices, skipping lunch, giving their lunch to the little sheep, 
and also wearing a tight rope around their waist. Our Blessed Mother said God was happy, but as a beautiful mother, maternal, kind, gracious, and loving, she wanted to make sure that the children did not become sick because of the sacrifice. These are the very important summons which we have in the message of Fatima. The entire message of Fatima really is about sacrifice. It's really about, again, praying, praying the Holy Rosary every day, wearing the brown scapular, and doing one's daily duties. Well, this message of Fatima, as we know, is good news to be shared. There are many Catholics who are aware of Fatima and its message, many who are not. I remember I just entered the seminary in 1984, and there was a poll done around that time that said, in the United States, only about 2% of Catholics had ever even heard of Fatima. That was 1984. I think in 30 years, probably a lot of inroads, thank God, thanks to Our Lady, have been made. But yet still today, there's a lot of work to be done. What Our Blessed Lady told the three children is also pertinent for us. There's so much we can do in our families and parishes to promote Our Lady and her words to the children. We can recite the Holy Rosary at home. We can ask our pastor for permission to pray in the church the Holy Rosary before and after Holy Mass. We can present the brown scapular to the children and help to enroll them, help to educate them in this great gift. And especially, we can seek to evangelize effectively by living the Fatima message, praying the rosary ourselves, frequently the sacraments of the church, reciting the various prayers that we've been taught through our lives, wearing the brown scapular, and of course performing our daily duty. And it's about this summon of sacrifice which Our Lady uttered at Fatima, which finds root in our heart, especially in this desire to evangelize. We want others to know about Our Lady's summons as well. We want others to know about her call to sacrifice. You may know that when Pope Benedict went to Fatima in 2010, on that pilgrimage, he gave an interview to the journalists on the papal plain and this is what he said about our, re our reply to Our Lady's message at Fatima. This is Pope Benedict. The important thing is that that message, the response of Fatima in substance, is not directed to particular devotions, but precisely to the fundamental response, that is to ongoing conversion, prayer, penance, and the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Thus we see here the true fundamental response which the church must give, which we, every one of us, must give in this situation. As for the new things which we can find in this message today, there is also the fact that attacks on the Pope and the church come not only from without, but the sufferings of the church come precisely from within the church, from the sin existing within the church. This too is something that we have always known, but today we are seeing it in a really terrifying way, that the greatest persecution of the church comes not from her enemies without, but arises from sin within, and that the church thus has a deep need to, rele to relearn penance, to accept purification, to live forgiveness on the one hand, but also the need for justice. Forgiveness does not replace justice. In a word, Pope Benedict says, we need to relearn precisely this essential, conversion, prayer, penance, and the theological virtues. This is our response. We are realists in expecting that evil always attacks attacks from within and without, yet that the forces of good are also ever-present, and that in the end, the Lord is more powerful than evil, and Our Lady is for us the visible, motherly guarantee of God's goodness, which is always the last word in history. 
How comforting. God always wins. Our Lady is always there with her tender kindness. Fatima is about loving God. It's about hearing and responding to Mary's summons for sinners. We want to do as Our Lady asked. We want to do all we can. We don't want to disappoint her and her divine son, but rather to live as the two hearts desire. The Fatima message, the message that continues to resound today. And since 1917, there have been incredible witnesses to the Fatima message, those who have lived this message with vigor and truth. I'd like to share a little bit about how St. Maximilian Mary Kolbe lived the Fatima summons to sacrifice. There's a beautiful little pamphlet entitled Blessed Maximilian Kolbe, written before his canonization, priest hero of a death camp. Blessed Maximilian Kolbe, priest hero of a death camp by Mary Craig, C-R-A-I-G, published by the Catholic Truth Society, London, England. The sacrifice for sinners, which Our Lady asked for at Fatima, was part and parcel of the life of St. Maximilian Kolbe. This extraordinary person was named Raymond at birth. And we know that in his infancy, one day, Raymond seems to have been somewhat mischievous in some kind of action. His dear mother scolded him, and it seems as though those words had immense effect on him. Later he explained, that night I asked the mother of God what was to become of me. And many of us know this in story, but I think it's pertinent. Then she came to me holding two crowns, one white, the other red. She asked if I was willing to accept either of these crowns. The white one meant that I should persevere in purity, and the red that I should become a martyr. I said that I would accept them both. An incredible story, this audacious little boy who looks to our loving mother and says, I'll take them both. I'll take both the white and the red. Raymond was an excellent student. He loved mathematics and physics, among other things, especially theology and philosophy. For a time, he even had great interest in military affairs. But after a while, the dream to be a great soldier died down, and now he saw on the horizon a new cause, spiritual union with God through Mary. That would be the consuming joy and passion of his life. Well, Maximilian joined and was accepted into the conventual Franciscans as a seminarian. He studied philosophy and theology in Rome, that desire to be a great soldier continued, but again, not along the signs of enlisting in an army, but rather in a different kind of army. Now he saw the world and saw that at times it was downright evil. He decided the fight was really a spiritual one. On the 16th of October, 1917, three days, three days after the spinning of the sun at Fatima, he, along with six companions, founded, founded the Crusade of Mary Immaculate, Militia Immaculate, with the aim of converting sinners, heretics and schismatics, particularly Freemasons, and bringing all men to love Mary Immaculate. This cannot be underestimated. This is really an answer to the call to sacrifice. By doing this, St. Maximilian Kolbe was really opening himself up to all the sacrifices that would come because of his great love to help all souls get, go to heaven. St. Maximilian left Rome and returned to Poland in 1919 and saw that his country was once again free, a liberation which he, as he always did, attributed to Mary Immaculate. Maximilian was very involved with wanting to win souls for Christ through Mary. And 
He helped with the publishing of the magazine, The Night of the Immaculate in Krakow. The funds were very low, and it seemed to skeptics that this project would never take off. But for those of you who have found a little bit about the life of St. Maximilian, you see how his journalistic endeavors bore incredible fruit. St. Maximilian also journeyed to Japan and was a great missionary, helping others, especially those in Japan who are not Christians, little by little come to appreciate Jesus Christ and his mother. St. Maximilian had his sights on doing great things for God, but all these projects demanded something from him. His physical health started to deteriorate. His spiritual health, of course, continued to increase. Some have said St. Max Maximilian was almost rather a restless spirit. His activities couldn't be confined to just one religious house or even to one country. And so when he left for Japan to the Far East, he was convinced that this was God's plan for him, to share faith in Christ with those around him there in that different land. Despite his passionate zeal in the name of Mary, he true proved to be a true and wise and prudent missionary. He didn't attempt to impose Western ideas on those of Japan, but rather always wanted to share true faith in Christ, which really transcends all national boundaries. Again, Father Maximilian's health began to deteriorate even more, but this did not allow him to stop. Even though he had sickness and decreased energy, he went forth in faith. In 1936, he was recalled to Poland and left Japan for the last time. He continued with his great efforts to promote Mary in his homeland, especially through the press. Many of us know the end story of his life, how the Gestapo came and took him from the friary. He was, of course, a victim soul, someone who offered himself completely, someone who gave himself for sinners. St. Maximilian was a hero. And when he offered himself for that husband and father in the concentration camp at Auschwitz, it was really only, you could say, a natural outcome of his sacrifice for so many years. It was as if it was the thing to do. It was almost as if he did this without too much continued reflection. All the sacrifices that he had committed throughout his life now were being shown in this incredible act, this act which would lead to his martyrdom. And we know on the 14th of August, 1941, St. Maximilian died at Auschwitz. He is a great saint in the life of the church. He continues to remind us of the importance of sacrifice. And we have to say, when it comes to St. Maximilian Kolbe, that he is truly a man of our times. He lived in these terrible, terrible times of persecution, times of hatred for the church, times of hatred for the Holy Father. And yet, the fact that there was so much hate and bitterness around him did not in any way make him bitter. He was not embittered at all. There was a certain joy, a certain childlike nature of St. Maximilian. All, no doubt, we can attribute to Our Lady and her influence over him. St. Maximilian was a man of prayer. He began and ended his days with prayer, how he loved the Holy Mass, how he received the sacraments himself, and how he enjoyed administering the sacraments to others. St. Maximilian was a man of sacrifice who always gave of himself to the very end. He emptied himself. He took upon himself the sins and sacrifices of others. St. Maximilian was also a man of study who never stopped learning, who never stopped growing. Sometimes we forget St. Maximilian was a great theologian, a great Mariologist. Yes, we rightly look at the martyrdom, the act of martyrdom at Auschwitz, but also what about all those times of study, all those times of going deeper into the doctrines of the church? 
St. Maximilian proclaimed Jesus to all people, Jesus Christ crucified and risen. St. Maximilian was approachable. The people of God came to him. They were not afraid to come to him and present themselves to him. St. Maximilian lived the summons of Our Lady of Fatima. Mary requested sacrifice. St. Mary Maximilian Kolbe fulfilled the request. Our Lady insisted on living one's daily duty. This great Polish conventual embraced his daily duty. This son of Mary remains for us a great hero, a great example, a great challenge, and a great model for ourselves. Although perhaps none of us, only God knows, will be asked to be martyrs in the sense of the word that we usually think, red martyrs giving our blood for Christ and the church. Nevertheless, we know we all have sacrifices to make. God accepts our sacrifices. And we want to make sure that as St. Maximilian did, whatever sacrifice God calls of us, we offer it to God with joy. Mary has summoned us to sacrifice May we fulfill that request as her beloved son, St. Maximilian Kolbe, did. God bless you and Mary keep you. There's still a bit of time. Anyone has a question they want to pose? Others want to come on up. Thank you. Thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, well, I turned 18 in Fatima with Father Fox. I was so fortunate. So I knew him well. Um, and I just I handed this out to my CCD class um, for Mary. The prayer that she taught um, was when you sacrifice, oh Jesus, it is for your love, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I just love. I wear a metal scapular. How does that fit in with the brown scapular? Thank you very much. How does the brown scapular uh, metal compared to the cloth scapular? My understanding that is that traditionally we've had the cloth scapular, which is derived from the Carmelite habit. We think of the Carmelites who wear this very large scapular over their shoulders. The cloth scapular then has been perhaps the traditional way of wearing the scapular. But there is a metal scapular oftentimes used by those who have trouble with cloth, especially maybe people who have rashes or whatever. My understanding is, is that um, while the, the cloth scapular probably is preferred because of the long history, especially if someone has an allergy to cloth of some kind, that the metal scapular is, is permitted. Um, certainly, it's a sacramental, and it's a wonderful blessing. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.